PRD Board of Directors meeting for January 12th, 2022. Jessica, can you please call roll? Tia Ping. Here. Heidi Edwards. Here. Barbie Miner. Here. Felicita Monteblanco. Here. Alfredo Moreno. Here. Great. And then um, do we have any action items resulting from executive session? We do. I would like to move that the board authorize staff to dedicate right of way and a slope easement in the northwest quadrant of the district for consideration discussed in executive session tonight, um, subject to the standard due diligence review and approval by the general manager. Uh, this is Felicita. I'll second. Jessica, can you call a vote? Barbie Miner? Yes. Alfredo Moreno? Yes. Felicia de Monteblanco? Yes. Heidi Edwards? Yes. Tia Ping? Yes. And then next looks like we have the audit report by Julie and Olivia. You bet. I think Olivia is going to open us up. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Your packet includes a copy of the district's audited annual comprehensive financial report and schedule of expenditures of federal awards. I'd like to take a minute to thank our audit committee members for their support this year, Suzanne Lanine, Elizabeth Edwards, and Heidi Edwards. I'd like to introduce our audit partner, Julie Fahey from Talbot, Corvola, and Warwick, TKW. Julie and her team worked many hours, including evenings and weekends, to ensure the audit was completed and financial reports issued prior to December 31st. We appreciated their flexibility and patience as we worked through the fieldwork testing and preparation of the required financial reports. Thank you, Julie. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to her. All right, thank you, Olivia. Um, well done, thank you for that, that great introduction. So as you can see here, I'm here to present uh, the audit results for the district for this last fiscal year, June 30, 2021. And so I kind of ha just have a brief slide presentation that we'll kind of go through, but I'm happy to answer any questions at any point if you have any. So moving on to the next slide, kind of just overview of the audit. So as we are in our second year of a pandemic year conducting the audit, it was mostly remote. Um, there are on occasion where we might visit the district where it's easier to look at records on site. Um, but in a remote environment, we had interim field work for one week in May. Then we return to uh, conduct the final field work in October, and we did that. And then we issued the financial statements in December, as well as a single auto report that I'll discuss in a little bit. So just an overview of the financial statements for this year. There were no new major funds for testing. The financial statements, the annual, comp annual comprehensive financial report looks very similar in presentation to what you would have seen in prior year um, when looking at the basic financial statements. So I will say, though, the district, something different, the district for its first time that I'm aware of was subject to a single audit. So the district spent approximately about $4.3 million in coronavirus relief fund expenditures. So this was federal funding. Most of it came as a pass through from U.S. Treasury to Washington County and then to the district. And uh, so they spent that. And then as a result of spending, the rule is, is as a result of spending greater than $750,000, uh, a government entity is subject to a single audit under uniform guidance. And so we're very experienced in a lot of governments being subject to single audit. So we conducted our first single audit testing for the district this year. OK, moving on to the next slide. These are our audit results and reporting. So within the actual financial statements, that it's about a 100 page document that Olivia and her team puts together. Uh, we have two reports within it, within the annual comprehensive financial report. The first one being the independent auditors report. This was an unmodified opinion. It's a clean opinion. It's what you're looking for when you're having an audit. So essentially it says, and this starts on page nine, if you guys ever have the electronic version available or if you printed one, but essentially says based on all the audit procedures that we did, um, through interim and final field work and all the follow up and all the testing that we did that we feel that the financial statements are presented fairly in accordance with GAAP. So it's a good thing. 
after just kind of a little overview of the financial report after our independent audit report is a section called the management discussion analysis if you're ever short on time of this almost 100 page document i always direct readers to start with the mdna it provides a good overview uh, a just comparison of prior year and current year so 21 and 20 uh, just a good overview of the transactions for the district so following the MDNA, just kind of an overview, is your basic financial statements. So your statement of net position and your statement of activities. And then it goes into a whole bunch of other schedules and then note supports with support to the basic financial statements. So at the end of this almost 100 page document, I think it's like 96 pages, we have another report and that's what's listed here. This report on compliance and internal control over financial reporting based on an audit in accordance with Oregon state regulations. So as a governmental entity, the state of Oregon asks us as the external auditors to look at certain items, and those are listed on bullet format on page 96 of that ACFR. Uh, so certain items that we look at, we're happy to report that we hadn't found no non-compliance when we looked at those areas. Some of them cover, you know, budget law, they cover procurement, insurance, just different areas, um, and so happy to report no non-compliance. Okay, so the next slide. The single audit report. So again, um, first time that I'm aware that the district's been subject to a single audit. In conducting a single audit, we had one major program, that Coronavirus Relief Fund of about 4.3 million. So we follow and we test certain compliance requirements that are set um, by the OMB. And so we audit according to those compliance requirements. Happy to report that we had no findings. So as a result of a single audit, there are two reports that we issue, and those are listed here. So you can see that. And this is the report on internal control in accordance with government auditing standards. So essentially we issued an unmodified opinion. There were no findings related to internal controls over financial reporting. Then the second report is a report on compliance for each major federal program, which is that coronavirus relief fund. And then as well as a report on internal control for compliance and a report on the CEPA, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. All of that we found to have no no exceptions, no findings related to it. So an unmodified opinion. The one program I have listed there is that assistance listing number, uh, the COVID money for the coronavirus relief fund. So that's really that's great for the district. Um, they did a really well, good job of managing and documenting and following the compliance requirements. So the next slide is our communications as external auditors to you. We did meet with the audit committee, but also I'm presenting to you as the board. Um, so there are certain under professional standards, certain items that we like to communicate. And I've highlighted those here. There's also an actual written letter um, that you have available and accessible to you as well uh, to be able to review. But essentially some of the highlights are there were no difficulties encountered during the audit, no auditor proposed adjusting journal entries, no uncorrected misstatements, no disagreements with management, we're not aware of any consultations that management had with other accountants. And then it kind of also overviews some upcoming GASB standards that the district will look at implementing as they're applicable. So that's kind of a, a quick overview um, of the audit for this last year. Um, I do believe the district was submitting their ACFR, the, the whole annual comprehensive financial report to the GFOA. So it's the Government Finance Officers Association for another award, which I'm sure will be awarded. So that should be their 17th year. Happy to report that. Um, so we would expect that. And uh, just at this point, I'd like to think, you know, give appreciation to to Olivia, well, to Doug um, for um, helping facilitate um, all of this. And then as well, uh, Olivia and uh, Cindy just being super involved and super supportive with the audit and um, helping to see it through. Are there any questions about the financial statements, um, any of the results, um, anything that different this year? I don't think so. Thank you so much for that great presentation and thank you so much for our budget committees and everyone for just and staff for doing just a wonderful job to make this process so easy and seamless every year it seems like so wonderful job everyone. Thank you Julie. Yeah you. if I could add to uh, Tia uh, you know it's pretty unique uh, in the time period as the board is well aware uh, to be without a CFO and the step up 
by Olivia, her team, and Cindy and her team, uh, really remarkable. Uh, I think another example of what you, you, you do and need to get done in front of you that's critical for the district's operations. Uh, Julie was very supportive in the process. We had a, a number of conversations and uh, she actually uh, inadvertently, I think, stumbled into a, you know, one of the many things that being a general manager doesn't mean you're an expert in any field, but she qualified that my acumen in terms of the financial side actually has improved. And I said, well, that's what you do when you don't have a CFO. Uh, now, the other great news is we're, we're in process. I'll provide the board an update um, before end of week with regard to our recruitment. But one of the nice things that um, we've been able to do is Julie has uh, stepped into after being not not terribly talked to about the opportunity in front of her to sit on our one of our state uh, holder panels and and uh, along with Olivia and Cindy uh, to really help us through the assessment part of, of ensuring that we obtain a CFO that has all the skill sets that the district needs. So we appreciate that, uh, Julie, on your effort to help us through that process. Absolutely. Well worth it. Thank you. Do I have a motion after that presentation? Yes, you do. Uh, I move this Alfredo. I move that the board of directors accept the audit report in the park district's annual comprehensive financial report and schedule of expenditures of federal awards for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2021. This is Heidi. I'm happy to second that motion. Great. Jessica, can you call vote? Felicia de Monteblanco? Yes. Barbie Minor? Yes. Heidi Edwards? Yes. Alfredo Moreno? Yes. Tia Ping? Yes. Perfect. Thank you again, everybody, for all the great work. Um, so moving on, we are going to audience time. And I believe we do have a live presenter today. Yes, we should have uh, Nisha George on the line here. Nisha, if you want to unmute and uh, turn on your camera if you have it available. Hey. Hi, Nisha. OK, you can go ahead and start whenever you're ready. OK. Hi, my name is Nisha George, and uh, my address is 16822 Northwest Better Drive. Um, so hello, THPRD Board of Directors. Um, I wanted to talk to you today because Washington County has accepted an application to build a gas station in the Bethany area at Northwest 185th and Northwest West Union, um, right across the street from the Albertsons. The application proposes to store 52,000 gallons of petroleum within 80 feet of the THPRD Rock Creek Wetland and Bethany Lake. This is land use case L21. 00244, um, if you want to look it up. <laughs> Current Washington County land use code allows gas stations to be built in any neighborhood commercial zone and does not specify any additional restrictions on the setbacks from sensitive areas or limits on the size of underground fuel storage tanks. According to the Oregon DEQ, in the last 12 months, 3% of the roughly 1,700 regulated underground storage tank sites across the state have leaked. Their data shows leaks originating from the tank, the pipes, dispensers, and from delivery mistakes. These leaks cause fuel to end up in the surrounding soil and water. And at a 3% yearly failure rate, it isn't a question of if, but when a leak will happen. A spill into the Rock Creek wetland would be a disaster and would likely cost hundreds of thousands to millions to clean up. And besides the cost, it would cause irreparable damage to this beloved park and ecosystem. So I'm part of a group of neighbors organizing Washington County commissioners to pass a land use code update to ban the development of gas stations within 1500 feet of residences, public parks or playgrounds schools, hospitals, churches, theaters, public libraries, or buildings for public assembly, or any wetland, stream, river, floodplain, or environment, environmentally sensitive area. Many other counties and cities across the country have passed code updates already. Washington County 
should catch up. So I'm here to ask the THPRD board if you support Washington County adding a setback requirement to protect public lands from damage from gas station leaks. If so, I am here to encourage the THPRD board to submit letters to the Washington County Board of Commissioners showing your support. Um, and if you want more information, please see um, our website's postpump.org for examples of setback requirements passed by other counties. And please see nabgas, that's N-A-B-G-A-S dot com for information on the Bethany gas station application. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much, Nisha, for your um, testimony. And this has been on our radar and we have discussed it in, um, in the past and definitely it's up for future conversations after your testimony. So we really thank you for your um, your your testimony and, and we definitely it is it is something that is very important to all of us. So thank you so much for your time. Doug, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, we're certainly uh, interested as well in looking into uh, code adjustments. Uh, you know, we'll we'll follow the process. Uh, we, as one of the one of the developers in the area, will have an opportunity to comment, and certainly we can bring that before the board for sure. Thank you so much again for your time. Thanks. All right, and so um, I have no written testimony, correct, Jessica? Okay. That's Just correct. Perfect. Okay, we will move on to committee liaisons. Does anybody want to go first? I'll give you five seconds. Heidi will go first. <laughs> um, I'm going to be short and sweet. I think with the holiday holidays and the new year, uh, it was sort of a little bit of a quiet month, but I'm just going to sing the praises of our audit team again. Um, that's my report. That's uh, who I'm, I'm li liaison to that committee and really impressed with Julie and Olivia and, and Cindy's work. And I, I took down notes when we were meeting. I'm a little bit of a novice when it comes to audit. So I was taking notes for, fairly fur fur furiously, but noted the two things that we need to commend them on, their care and due diligence, a solid documentation that is really leading the way, um, as well as um, no non-compliance noted. That's always a great thing. So <laughs> yay team, um, really impressive. I'm not gonna say much more because there was a lot of great um, uh, pieces said in the presentation earlier, but thank you again to that team and to our volunteer um, audit committee members as well. And beside that, um, at the beginning of December, we did interview folks for our new budget or budget committee folks. So we did that at the beginning and look forward to pulling everybody together for this next budget cycle soon. Thank you, Heidi. Does anybody else have anything else they want to present? Felicita? Uh, just real fast, I sent y'all the uh, preschool um, for all uh, document that might interest you around um, the quality framework um, for the work. Um, and then I'll just share from Nature and Trails. Uh, at the last meeting, the group learned about the district's integrated pest management program um, and elected a new chair and secretary. Um, and uh, like many uh, of the committees, uh, we have four new members starting in this month. That's it. Great, Barbiera Alfredo. Alfredo. Uh, yeah, um, I just wanted to share um, my appreciation for uh, uh, THPRD working with the Five Oaks Museum, which, full disclosure, I'm I serve on their board as well, um, to host um, what's being called a, a Museo Ambulante for um, for the museum's um, hashtag Stand Up FG. Um, exhibition. So um, these will be um, signs kind of um, reflecting on student activism, community pride, and ethnic studies that we'll be hosting at Autumn Ridge Park, Recuerdo Park, Camille Park, Greenway Park, Cedar Hills Park, and the HMT Recreation Center, which has these beautiful murals. So um, shout out to the district for being collaborative and contributing to placemaking and um, uplift of, of communities. So thank you. 
Thank you, Barbie. Oh, you're still on mute, Barbie. I put my hand down, but then I didn't turn off the turn on the mic. Well, we got to go in here. <laughs> Just wanted to share from program and event side of the house that I'm looking forward to kicking off our first meeting of the year next week and mm -hmm. welcoming our, our new members as well. So excited to share more, um, but certainly looking forward to next week and getting engaged with our new folks who have joined our committee. Thank you. And then as for myself, um, last month was pretty quiet. Uh, Doug and I did meet with um, Janine Salman um, and presented kind of what THPRD is doing and um, she had questions and we just updated her on as they go on to next session just to kind of keep the um, communication channels open. So that was a great conversation. Um, other than that, uh, Trace started um, basketball the other day and swimming class so all the preschool things are in full swing. Um, I want to thank staff um, for really being diligent about masking our especially our preschoolers who cannot um, get vaccinated. Um, they were uh, I want to encourage all of our um, community members who do partake in these classes to feel free to speak up because our staff is willing to do what it takes to keep our kids safe. Um, there was a at the beginning as with new stuff um, one of the kids didn't have masks and I just mentioned something and they were quick to grab a mask that they had on um, on hand because the child hadn't brought one and was able to get it on that the little kiddo. And so um, I was very appreciative of the quick action once um, somebody spoke up. So thank you so much for staff for really being diligent um, about masking, especially in the time of Omicron and stuff. And Trace is having a blast having something every day, swimming and basketball. So um, he may not be that good at it, but it's kind of fun to watch these little three-year-olds run around and run amok because they don't usually get that opportunity to see very many people now. So thank you to staff. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. All right, so next we have um, consent agenda. Do I have a motion for consent agenda? Sure, this is Barbie. I move that the board approve the consent agenda as submitted. Do I have a second? This is Alfredo, I second. Great, and Jessica, can you please call roll? Heidi Edwards? Yes. Felicita Monteblanco? Yes. Barbie Miner? Yes. Alfredo Moreno? Yes. Tia Ping? Yes. Perfect. And now we are moving on to the general manager's report. I will give it away to Doug. You bet. We're going to kick off with a language access policy update, and Holly and Jess Preet have that. Okay. Good evening, members of the board of directors. I'm Holly Thompson, your communications director, and I'm joined this evening by Jaspreet Shahal, community engagement specialist. It is our privilege to orient you to some work that we're beginning this fiscal year to develop a language access policy for the district. This is really meaningful work, and we expect to have a new language access policy adopted by the end of the fiscal year. On the next slide, we'll see what we'll be covering um, this evening. In general, we want to go through the overview of the policy and the purpose. The purpose of the policy is to make sure that we are effectively extending meaningful access to English language learners throughout the community. It is also a requirement of federal law that we provide and have a language access policy. It will be a data driven approach that will inform and direct what um, materials we translate into what languages. And the purpose is to really make sure that we're providing meaningful and effective access to all patrons on things that they absolutely are entitled to and need to be able to access THPRD services. We'll be looking at the highest spoken languages throughout the district. We'll be determining what vital documents we have at THPRD and ensuring that those uh, documents are available in appropriate languages and finalizing a policy to dictate our translation moving forward. On the next slide, just as background, um, 
This work, it has roots in our landmark 1964 legislation that was passed in the United States, ensuring that we were protecting individuals from discrimination. It also has origins in an executive order signed by President Clinton in 2000, which required all federal agencies to provide um, meaningful access to improve access for people with limited English proficiency. Now, we are not a federal agency, but we are a local government, a special purpose government. We do receive on occasion federal funding as well as pass through federal funding from state or county government, which means that we are required by federal law to adopt a language access policy. With that, on the next slide, I'll turn it over to Joss Breed. Thanks, Holly. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, board uh, board members. My name is Jess Preet. I um, so we wanted to kick off uh, a little bit with the definitions of the terms that you will continue to hear throughout this presentation. So one of the um, the terms that you've already heard is English language learners. Um, this is defined as individuals for whom uh, English is not their primary language, and um, also including people who are currently building their English skills and capacity toward becoming bilingual or multilingual. The federally used terminology is um, LEP, or which stands for Limited English Proficient. Um, we at the district are recommending um, a people-centered language um, with the intent of living and embodying our values uh, and continuing that forward um, and proposing that we move forward with ELL or Individuals Learning English to emphasize the positive versus the limiting aspects of an individual's ability. On the next slide, um, you'll see another definition which is critical to this work, which is meaningful access and an, another term that you've already heard of. Um, so the, this is defined as the ability of ELLs to participate in and use all of the services provided um, and offered by the district. Um, access to services is timely and not significantly restricted, delayed or inferior compared to English proficient individuals. Uh, in practice, what this looks like is um, ELLs have meaningful access when they can um, access um, adequate information to um, in culturally effective and culturally responsive ways. They can understand the services and benefits available to them in ways that best serve them. Um, they receive services for which they're eligible, as well as can communicate the relevant circumstances of their situation to the service provider. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to pass off the baton to Holly. So, Translational materials can be a very challenging and complex topic, and the federal government recognizes that it isn't practical or doesn't make sense to translate everything that you do in every possible language out there. So there is a lot of history and a lot of good work that has been done to provide guidance to help us establish a rational uh, policy that makes sense, that meets the needs of most of the people that we serve and is balanced and has takes into account fiscal ability and budgetary realities. So we have a lot of good information to base our to base our policy development. One of the cornerstones of that is having an agency determine what their vital documents are. These are the documents that we produce that are essential for people to have access to, to be able to access the services, or in some cases, to understand if services are maybe not available to them. So the categorization to think about how to determine if something is a vital document um, has to do with sort of the topics that it addresses, and those topics um, coalesce around safety, health, benefits, eligibility, financial impacts, notice of rights or disciplinary action. In our world, you would think maybe the exclusion notices that we produce or on occasion give out, and a potential for important consequences. On the next slide, we worked through and share some examples from the federal government of um, understanding in those categories what those examples might be. What's more interesting, I think, is the second half of the slide that zeroes in on a THPRD context. So we've drilled down a little bit more to explain that we're talking about health and safety notices, rules and regulations, 
access to things such as financial aid applications, the marketing materials around that, requests for assistance based on disability or other things. So these are all examples to help us as, as staff determine what are vital documents and to provide a lens for us to evaluate everything that we produce in the district. On the next slide, you'll see the project phases that we're working through. So right now, uh, Jaspreet is our project manager and we have a core project team where we have refined um, our scope. We've done research and looking at many other jurisdictions of what their language access policies are, both throughout the Portland metro region and others as well. We've looked at state agencies, we've looked at federal resources. We're also transitioning to a organizational assessment. So we are going to be having a point person in each one of our divisions that we'll be working with that will help us on that vital documents research. We'll, we'll, we'll give direction and guidance and start to gather all of our vital documents to review those to ensure that we've, we're capturing everything, we're categorizing everything correctly. You'll remember that we put extra funding in this year's budget to help with language access policy implementation. So we do have extra funds available this year. We ramped up in anticipation of having a lot of documents to translate and then plan to um, have that work done by the end of the fiscal year. All of this moving towards a policy uh, adoption in June. This will be a general manager level policy, so one that Doug will be signing and putting in, and then we'll work on an implementation and communication plan and ongoing assessment of our work. We will continue to work on centralizing our budget and our tracking of all translations district wide, so we'll have really good data and be able to report out um, our KPIs through the budget process, and you'll have lots of information about what we're translating and the volume of those translations and the impact of that. On the next slide, you can see some of the work that uh, we will be doing in the second phase between um, February and May. So as part of our assessment, the federal government outlines a four factor analysis, and it's part of what you do to balance determining um, what will be translated and in what languages. So the first thing that we do is we look at the number or proportion of ELLs, English language learners throughout our community. We're doing a lot of data analysis right now, and we've been working really closely with the school district, and I've had several meetings with them. Um, looking at their data as well as city of Beaverton and ACS data to really understand the highest number of ELLs in what languages throughout our community. We'll also do some survey work within our own centers to determine um, we'll pick sort of like with the homeless issue, how you do a point in time count. We'll pick a week where we'll do a count and we'll count um, all of the ELL contacts district wide for a week and in what languages so we can get a sense of what we're seeing on the ground day to day in any given week in the district. And then we'll go through that vital documents research where we really understand what the documents are, the importance of the document, how that stacks up in terms of access and rights. All of that balancing with the fourth factor test, which is around the financial piece how much is coming in that needs to be translated and in what languages and how how can we afford to do that on the next slide on the next <laughs> apologies holly um uh, so finally we have some exciting news for you um, to share with you all we're ready to test out a pilot project which is a testing tool uh, for expanding meaningful access. The tool we're using is um, um, a handheld device. It's called Pocket Talk. It's a voice translator. It's Wi-Fi compatible. It, it, it comes recommended and used by Beaverton School District front desk staff to facilitate ELL um, interactions. Um, it uh, has the ability to translate into 82 languages. And the timeline and staff usage is uh, we're expecting to roll this out in February or March of this year. Um, right now we are um, purchasing four to five devices but, uh, being purchased by the communications division. And our early testers are safety services staff for field usage, as well as uh, 
staff at the Athletic Center that are front desk staff to facilitate interactions with English language learners, that community members that walk in the door um, and test uh, effectiveness of these devices. We will be testing um, and uh, assessing this data for about 30 days. Um, and if successful, we'll continue to use language access funds from fiscal year 22 to purchase additional devices. Um, and with that, um, I believe we've come to the end of our presentation. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to share w uh, about where we are in the development of this meaningful, inclusive, and federally required policy. So thank you. Yeah, and just, just to end with a little cherry on the Sunday there, um, this is not part of language access policy, but we were so excited about this pilot, we wanted to toss it out there because we're really excited about this innovation and we think it's going to be a huge change in, in, in helping um, provide better service to our ELL community members. So we're done with the PowerPoint. We can turn that off. Thank you. Heidi, you had a question? More of a statement in the, I I love the approach that you're taking um, with it being English language learners rather than that second language or sort of that more uh, not as positive frame, positively framed. So thank you for that. And this is this is a topic that large institutions and small institutions struggle with. So I'm so happy we are putting the time and effort into it. It's really important. And I think it also obviously uh, calls out, you know, our values. And one of them is to really be of service to our diverse community. So thanks for the work that you're doing here. I'm really excited to see how it comes along and the use of technology, because there's so much technology that we can um, provide for patrons or utilize ourselves in um, these areas too. Great, Felicita. Thanks. Um, amazing, as usual. Awesome. Yay. Go team. Um, I'm curious and feel free to say, Felicita, I'm going to send you an email or Felicita that goes in the um, parking lot. But I'm curious, the we know that the one of the one of the first point of contacts for our our patrons is the website and how does how does the accessibility around that for English language learners impact how does this all connect and I know that might take a while but I'm curious um it is going to take a little while and it is a little bit of a of a ouchie to be honest with you I don't have a, a more professional term right now but it is a bit of an ouchie our website um is in-house and it is very dated and you know it's it's been built over and over. So the reality of it is, we need a new uh, go through a website update because because this website is built by ourselves and not hosted by someone else. We don't have that language translation accessibility component that you have with um, off the shelf providers that you can get as an as an add on to your feature. So that's why you see other government websites right now that have. Um, much easier tra uh, translation services than we do. It just isn't possible with our website. So Clint and I have been having some discussions. It will have to be a question of when we line up our website redo. Um, one suggestion that we're kicking around is sort of the timing of that, right? We've got to get through the Tyler Nemus implementation, and we know registration system is next. It's a question of do you consider website the front door to updating the registration system? Here's my, you know, here's here's the clue to where I'm at. I think it is, um, and I think we do it then and update that at the front door of our registration system update, and that would give us that compatibility um, to make it much better. So, the the reality is we just have to do the website update. That's really helpful, and there were pieces of that that I didn't know. So thank you, and it it doesn't negate from this great work, and it's so exciting to see us uh, live our values. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And if you ever go on like our Spanish website, it's a little bit, um, you know, it's not apples to apples. So we've got staff that are having to go in there and sort of pick and choose and update it because we don't have that fluid translation capability. It just isn't efficient. We've got to, we've got to change that. Great, thank you. I did have one question and this kind of takes this and puts it even further, but do we have plans as we rebuild programming and whatnot to offer classes in 
other languages, like especially like Spanish, right? We have a preschool, we have one of our elementary school, or multiple elementary schools that do bilingual. Um, is that an I option would, in the future? I would defer that question to uh, Sabrina or Julie. I would say we've had like also a bilingual Spanish language swim. So I know that's something that they're they're always looking at and wanting to expand, but specifics we'd have to have Julie and Sabrina follow up on. No worries. Perfect. Just was wondering if that was something. Great. Thank you. Oh, Alfredo had a question. Yeah, just real quick. Just um, appreciate the work. And I look forward to hearing how the how the pilot program goes. Um, and um, I think, yeah, it's great to build our capacity to be, you know, strategic with um, where we're allocating resources because it's it's true. We can't just be all things to uh, to. Uh, um, all people, so you do have to prioritize where we um, where we do lean into in terms of of language accessibility. But having this pilot program that could um, uh, can bridge the gap um, for those we don't have, um, you know, fluent speakers for um, is great. And um, I think just once we kind of build up, you know, that capacity, and then it's the next step is the community word of mouth starts to spread and people feel more comfortable, um, you know, saying, hey, those folks know what they're doing in there and they can you can go in there and speak in the in the language you're most comfortable with and and you'll be able to do all the things. So um, look forward to those those steps kind of stacking onto each other. So this is the this is the way to start it, though. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Holly and Jasper. Great. Next up uh, is uh, bridge and boardwalk update with Bruce. Good evening. Um, this is Bruce Barbrash, Nature and Trails Manager, and um, I'm here to talk to you about two projects that that have recent, relatively recently completed. Um, next slide, please. The first one is at the Fano Creek Greenway um, over in the kind of easterly part of the district off of 217 and Denny Road. This is a great project that that really shows perseverance and, and looking at the long game for the district. Um, back in 2013, the Park District staff, as well as Clean Water Services, started a habitat restoration project here, removing lots of non-native plants, replacing with native plants. We also saw a stream that was severely eroded, it looked sort of like a miniature Grand Canyon. And as much as we wanted to see something different, we simply did not have the resources to do that. But by putting our heads together, we worked really hard to find funding that would allow us to really transform the site. And what we ended up doing was creating a, not just a five-year habitat restoration project, but a new course for the stream that moved it from the east side of the site in sort of a more of a ditch-like fashion into a more meandering natural stream course. And we ended up with a 1,040-foot multi-stage channel, which kind of has different levels to it, such that, that it can accommodate a lot more flood water than the old stream could. And um, we were able to reduce erosion, create better habitat for wildlife. And in the process, um, next slide, please. We, we did a lot of work out there that, that at first looked a little intimidating. Here is a picture of a, a backhoe digging the new channel of the creek. Next slide, please. And then eventually we replaced culverts, which caused a constriction for fish and wildlife to pass upstream with a beautiful bridge. And this was done in large part because we were able to get a Metro Nature and Neighborhoods capital grant for about $250,000. So we were able to leverage bond funds, about $600,000 from Clean Water Services, and then the additional funds from Metro's Nature and Neighborhoods program. Next slide, please. Um, this is what the, the, the new channel looked like in 2000 when we completed the project and were able to, to get water from the old channel into the new one. And um, so far, it has been a really amazing project because everything has performed as it was designed to. And um, next slide, please. One of the really wonderful things that, that 
we hadn't fully anticipated was that the bridge that you see in the bottom left side of the screen has not just become a way to get over the creek, but it's actually become kind of a community gathering spot. And in the past, people would kind of walk down the trail, they'd cross over the culverts on a rainy day, there was no luck getting across. But now we've provided better access and it's wonderful to see people standing on the bridge, they look out over the site, they watch ducks and all kinds of other smaller creatures paddling and moving around out there. And it's, it's really fantastic. Um, I'm going to move on from here to another. Um, oh, I should note that we also received an ORPA design award at the fall conference for this project. This fell into the small project category. And so we were super thrilled about that. There's also a video that we made that we'll send you as a separate link so you can watch that later. It's three minutes and shows shows the bridge and the, the project in action. Um, let's move on to the second project. So over at the Tualatin Hills Nature Park, there's a two year um, sewer construction project, again with our partner Clean Water Services. And it's running roughly north south along Cedar Mill Creek right through the middle of the park. Um, there's been sort of a rolling closure of boardwalks there as they move through the different phases. And um, over on the westerly side of the park where you see the red circle, um, that's one of the first places where they worked on the sewer. Next slide, please. And, um, and there's a pretty big swath through that area. They had to remove the original boardwalk that was there in order to get those big pipes in the ground. The Vine Maple Trail and some of the other trails in that area have been closed for a bit to facilitate that, but as a result of the closure, each boardwalk that they touched, they rebuilt better um, and in a new location. Next slide. And so um, here during a wet time, there would have been a big lake which would have flooded the original boardwalk that was there. And so we've raised the boardwalk, we've realigned it. Next slide, please. And, um, and we've put on a, a new grippier, um, longer lasting surface in the wood that we had. And, and we were all very pleasantly surprised to see the wonderful view of the big pond um, from this boardwalk. It, it opened in late December to patrons and um, we've gotten really, really positive reviews from everyone who's been on it. So um, we're super excited because this is the first of, of three or four uh, or three other boardwalks and, and significant crossings of creeks and wetlands that will be redone to our, our newest standards as a result of the project. So um, that's that's the bridge and boardwalk update. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Bruce. Any questions from my board members? I think you did a great job. I just Thank always have oh. comments and I'm so sorry. Like I have to interject, I, you know, seeing the evolution, especially with Greenway and how it was, you know, the bulldozers and everything. And this is what over 20 years ago, was it over 20 years ago, Bruce? No, 10 years ago. We started in 2013 with the initial vision of this is what this site could really benefit from. Okay. And it, and it's amazing how, you know, if you have staff that stick around and, and have the support and the vision, you can do amazing things, but it's a, it's a long-term game. It's a long process. And so, and yeah. kudos for, you know, looking for external sources of uh, funding to get this work done too. It's really great. I'm excited to get to Twalton Hills now, the nature park. Great. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're on to comprehensive plan update in Aisha and Janine. Yes, good evening, everyone. I am Aisha Panis, the Park Services Director, and Janine Restad, our Planning Manager, is here with me tonight. And we're going to walk you just through a few slides to update you on our comprehensive planning efforts and other long-range planning work that we're doing. So Janine will kick us off with the next slide. So thank you, Aisha. In explaining to Aisha recently, getting her back up to speed with how the comprehensive plan, the elements we're developing for that plan fit with the vision action plan and strategic plan, I came up with this analogy. And I'm really sorry if I leave you all hungry afterwards, but my analogy was baking a cake. 
And it wasn't just baking a cake off the old fashioned recipe card. It was baking a cake off the blog. So if you think of the vision action plan that this is what the community has told us what we want to do over the next 20 years. So we'll stick with this cake analogy, which I don't know why I picked cake because I really bake bread, not cake, but I think it was because it was close to my birthday. So we have the vision action plan and that's really grounding and where we're drawing from for the comprehensive plan. We have these goal areas um, and four of them come directly from the vision action plan. I'll talk about the other three shortly. Underneath those goals, we built objectives and this was working groups that were cross departmental. It was really exciting, even though we were all what I call in the box, but getting everybody from the district, the input of these objectives, which generally are what we want from the cake. I want it to be chocolate cake, okay? Um, my dad wants it to be a seven layer chocolate cake. And these objectives are directly tied to the vision goal statements. Then we we've developed guiding principles. And then these are generally how we will go about baking the cake. You know, think of reading that blog where before you get to the recipe, there's all the things they've tried, what you should consider as you go through the 20 year process of implementing the vision action plan. And then after these guiding principles, we go back to the action items right out of the vision action plan and added a few more of the steps that we'll need to take. So we are working on coalescing all these, uh, refining them. We're hoping that they'll come to you in the upcoming months. Next in our hierarchy of documents is the strategic plan. And this is where we get into the nuts and bolts how to. Um, these are the directions for baking your cake. How much of each ingredient? So again, looking back up to the comprehensive plan, the vision action plan, one thing we've done in the comprehensive plan is prioritized all those 100, 108 action items into near term, which we hope to accomplish in three to five years. When you see this document, a lot of action items are near term because we're already doing so much. It may be that we need to do more of those. So the street strategic plan, the first one will take those near term items plus your priorities and goals and really synthesize down what we're going to undertake and how we're going to allocate our resources. And those resources include staff time, of course, budget, and that budget will include what outside funds and partnerships, because partnerships are really going to be key to us going forward. Uh, and then CAPRA, and I should feel free to jump in with a little more on CAPRA, but really making sure we're keeping our documents up to date, like the strategic plan, the vision and the comprehensive plans, those are going to be the, the evergreen, hopefully last us 15 to 20 years, but our functional plans and our work plans. Anything to add on CAPRA? Just that what we have found is a true value is that it it forces us to take the information that exists in people's brains, you know, as we change our processes, as we set new things in motion. Um, it, Capra is the the device that really pushes us to say we've got to document this, and that has come in so handy as we've seen movement in our organization, uh, movement movement between work groups, and so really documenting uh, our practices, um, our methodologies has been. Uh, something that CAPRA requires, and it's just a general good practice for us to be doing anyway. So next slide, please. Just a reminder, uh, as I mentioned earlier, four of the goal areas for the comprehensive plan come right from the vision action goal areas. These are welcoming and inclusive, play for everyone, preserving natural spaces, and accessible and safe. And under welcoming inclusive, I wanted to give you an example of one objective uh, that we've drafted. So you have the welcoming and inclusive and objective one is build community in spaces and ways that are welcoming, inclusive and belong to everyone. And then the guiding principles are a little more detailed. So look forward to seeing that. And then, as I mentioned, the next slide talks about 
three other goal areas. The, the, the first four were what the community told us, but there's much work that we do in the background that isn't seen but is necessary. I like to think of this as it's always hard to follow Bruce and Sabrina and Julie on a presentation with the things that I'm doing, which aren't as exciting, but they really keep us going, the district going. Of course, that first uh, new goal area is diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And as we were developing the comprehensive plan uh, goals, objectives, and guiding principles, there were themes that came up in every one of the original four goals, and DEIA was a big one. This is something that permeates everything we do, but also deserves to stand alone and really be called to attention, especially given the, the period where we're in, where we're really pushing that needle forward. Uh, technology and innovation. You heard it earlier in the presentation with language learning that making sure we're on the forefront with technology and innovation to make sure all have access uh, to our services. And then finally, a new goal area in the comprehensive plan of financial sustainability to make sure that we are here and able to provide the services that are so loved for the long run. And I believe the next slide has the uh, timeline. Aisha? Yes. Yeah, so I'll jump back in here and just, uh, you've seen this graphic before, I think for the most part, and we uh, just wanna share with you where we think we are right now. We do intend to continue working until late summer, mid-summer on the comprehensive plan. We um, will return to you in uh, a few months to share more updates. And we are doing our initial scoping work on the strategic plan, but we anticipate that work to really kick off in earnest uh, very soon. And that will trail just slightly to the comp plan. We'll be talking uh, about the status updates on the, that project as we come back to you um, in later spring as well. And then throughout this whole process and through this whole calendar year, we're working on updating policies and plans that we need to use as our evidence of compliance with CAPRA standards. And again, those are the best practices across the country for park and recreation agencies. And so we're working hard on bringing everything up to date. Um, we've done some work in the time since our initial accreditation five years ago, but um, there are still different things that we're discovering now that need updating. And so we're working on all of that. And there's a bunch of work that that really ties into what we're creating with our comp plan and, and our strategic plan. So those are our big, big uh, planning projects that we're undertaking this year. And where we hope to end up is being able to file our self-assessment report early in 2023 with an RPA. And at that point, we would um, enter that review process where we'd have people assigned to us to come out and visit, make sure we are doing what we're saying we're doing and um, just coming out to verify that we are the top notch park and recreation agency that I believe we are. And uh, ultimately that would conclude with a, a granting of reaccreditation at the fall conference for NRPA. So that's where we are now. We do anticipate coming back to you in April or May and we'll have more information to share with you then. If there's any questions, we're happy to answer them now. Heidi. Yes, quick question. Um, so locally, you know, I, I'm familiar with CAPRA, but of the other agencies similarly to us, are there any locally or within the Northwest that are CAPRA associated as well? And then is that something that we, when we have new hires, that we're training them and sharing what this means in case patrons are asking or just to further inform them, I guess? So with CAPRA, uh, there are definitely some in the Northwest. There hadn't been a huge representation among Oregon Park and Rec agencies. Um, I believe there were two, there were three that were CAPRA accredited when we first went through. So we were the fourth in the state. Um, it was Hillsboro and Bend and I believe Medford. And um, Bend has reaccredited, Hillsboro chose not to. I believe that Medford was going through reaccreditation and uh, Willamaline, our friends at Willamaline have um, kicked off their pursuit of Capra. So we're, we're in the upper notch, uh, upper echelon, I think, of park and rec agencies that have really put in the work to compare ourselves against the national standards and best practices. So um, that feels very good to us. Yeah. Um, 
I think there's something like 8,000 park and rec agencies across the country and the number of agencies that had been accredited or, you know, I think it's less than 500. So it's, it's a pretty exclusive group to be a part of. And um, it, it was, it was a pleasure to go through this effort. I say pleasure, maybe other people in our agency did not think it was a pleasure, but um, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a definite amount of work, but it's a comprehensive look at who you are as a park and rec agency. And so um, I think it was a very valuable time spent and I continue to think that. Um, I think your question about, is this something we orient our new staff to? I think that that's maybe an area that we could do a little bit better on. Um, certainly the the products of going through this effort are the things that we share, you know, our hand handbooks and our best practices manuals, those are things that are absolutely part of onboarding with, with our new uh, incoming staff. So um, being able to put things down in writing and share that with the next generation of park and recreation professionals has been a definite benefit to going through this process. Lisa? Hi, thank you. Uh, super fun and exciting. I'm curious, so when I think about like how I interact with patrons and uh, when people ask questions, I've never once sent like the comprehensive plan to someone, right? It's a very big document. Um, and I know everyone works on making it pretty. I, I guess I just want to say that, and again, this might be for the parking lot, but even like Janine's like analogy was super helpful uh, or metaphor because like there's all these different documents and like, what do they do? How do they guide the organization? Maybe that's something for the future website. I really like the evergreen uh, analogy. <laughs> um, so I just, I, I in my dream scenario, these are like super accessible documents. Of course, I, I know that not everyone has the time to read these huge documents. I guess I'm just, I'm struggling a bit with, like I know it's mostly for internal purposes. I get that. And like it says so much about like where we're going and how we're getting there that I, I wish all our patrons would read that, but they're not going to because they're busy. <laughs> we we completely understand what you're talking about, and I think uh, we we've, we've had ideas about the vision for this document, the comprehensive plan, and um, and I'll let Janine kind of describe that because she's done it several times. I've I've heard her share this this vision, um, but one thing that we we have absolutely understood and having Holly as our communications director um, the last couple of years has gotten us thinking a little bit differently and she made a comment recently about um, you know photos that we put into our budget book and um, the fact that it's not enough to just show a picture but we need to tell people what's happening in the picture we have to tell our story we have to explain what's happening and um, and that is something that makes the the story resonate more with people. Um, you know, they are looking at the pictures. And um, so we know the value of pictures. We know the value of graphics. And we absolutely, over the course of the time, since I started here in 2013, um, the, the documents that we put together were kind of dry, kind of dry. But, you know, as we moved through the functional plan process, I think by the time we got to the trails functional plan, we realized, no, we've got to put some color in here. We've got to put some, you know, graphics that have bright, splashy colors and photographs. And, um, and I'm really proud with, of what the trails functional plan looked like, what our new version of the parks functional plan looks like. And so I'd like Janine to describe sort of what we have in mind for our comp plan, because I think it's going to be even a, a further evolution of what we've been doing with regard to our printed plans. Yes, I had the uh, pleasure of kicking off the Hillsborough Comprehensive Plan. Uh, they redid it. And what we strove for there and I brought to the district was a third text, a third graphics, a third images. You really want it to be approachable. And I keep this on my desk. It's Hillsboroughs. It is like a coffee table book. Now, ours is not going to be this thick. Uh, <laughs> again, trying to keep it plain English. Uh, in the, the goals, objectives, and guiding principles sec sections, we've already put notes in where there should be a call-out box that either has the, the best practices or a picture of something. Uh, we're really looking forward to Henry getting his hands on this for the historic timeline, you know, think of it being a two page spread and having pictures and some text. We're capturing a lot of history that we'll keep in another place, but we just we really want this approachable and something that you'll be happy to hand to one of your counterparts or one of your patrons. Thanks, ladies. 
You're welcome. Um, if there are no more questions, I do want to slide in a, a, a super secret surprise PowerPoint um, because I, we couldn't let this night go by without acknowledging that we are here at Janine's very last board of directors meeting. And so we wanted to share with everyone if they're not aware that Janine has recently accepted uh, an offer to come join the Aurora Colorado team and she will be the planning and development services director there. So while we are super duper sad to say goodbye to her, uh, we are thrilled at this opportunity for her and we just wanted to take a few moments to acknowledge Acknowledge the incredible contribution she's made to the district over the last six and a half years. So I'll start out just by acknowledging that one of uh, the most wonderful things about Janine, and I, I, I say this as a professional colleague and as a personal friend, is that she is so good at building relationships. And you see some that she has cultivated with, um, with other very powerful and strong women throughout our community. And uh, I think that that is a, a really wonderful thing that she has brought to this district is her ability to make those connections um, and to use those connections to realize efforts that are going to benefit multiple agencies, multiple groups of people. And so that's been a really wonderful thing to watch her do here at the at the district. On the next slide, um, I just want to call out to the work she's done on just advancing our policies here at the district. And um, the, the image you see on the screen is one uh, of the award winning uh, Reflections Plaza at the um, the brand new uh, housing development there. It's an affordable housing development, and it was something that Janine was able to um, work through a process whereby the developer could um, save some dollars on SDC charges by investing those dollars that would have been spent right there at the site and created a wonderful public space for both the residents of the the development and our public to enjoy. So that was a wonderful process, but it couldn't have happened without all the work she did on SDC methodology and trying to realize the board's vision of um, being a player in the solutions for affordable housing. So um, I see that there's a bunch of hands going up. I, I could take those you know, people and have you speak now, or we could hold them to the end if that wouldn't be too bad. I'm going to I'm going to power through. Um, so and then finally, just the update of the functional plan and the work she's done there. Um, another big, big change for us at the district has just been um, the just incredible success of our grant program. And Janine was on the forefront of crafting that program and making an, a, an extremely wonderful hire in our grant specialist, Cindy Dower, who has been able to um, garner the strength of our internal staff to work on areas that we think that grants could benefit the district, as well as working with our foundation um, and outside partners. So we've been able to bring in millions of dollars to serve our, our community through the grant program, and it's been really tremendous and, um, and as a result of Janine's leadership. So I think one more slide is maybe what I've got here. Um, and, you know, again, the building of relationships, um, it didn't always happen just because she bought all the matching clothes to all of the staff here, but um, it didn't hurt that she did that. So she um, she's really fostered great relationships with our uh, friends at the city of Beaverton and Washington County. And she's also been very helpful in getting all of our departments working together. Um, she's been a tremendous champion for the district. We thank her so very much for everything she's done for THPRD, and I'm happy to uh, pass the mic, if you will, to anyone else who would like to share their thoughts about Janine. I don't know the order, so I'm just gonna start with Felicita. It's good and bad, I guess. I don't wanna go first. Um, well, Aisha went first. <laughs> um, no, I mean, Thank you, Aisha, for preparing something so thoughtful. And my goodness, you are going to be so missed and you're so appreciated, appreciated, Janine. And I mean, it it is completely like the affordable housing work, like it would not have happened without you. And not only you being a champion, but also working to understand all the intricacies and like build build relationships with community partners and like and while you will be very, very missed, like the work continues and you have this huge impact on the community and all those units are going to be built because of your leadership and your your commitment to this journey. And I just I'm I'm forever appreciative. So thank you. Heidi. 
I will echo that. And as far as SDCs and other, you know, this is a learning curve for many of us. Um, I feel like I learned a lot from you and I'm so appreciative because you were patient with us as a board. You were patient and spent the time that we needed to really thoughtfully get through some really important decisions for the district. I mean, you are a part of this legacy now and I hope you never forget that. I also wanted to say what I love about you, Janine, is you also do such a great job of personalizing your work with who you are and where you live. Like you live close to the trail and you ride or you walk or, you know, you you really, I mean, you care about this place and I, I feel that. And I think that's such a great part of the work that you do. And um, it really is a testament to who you are and how professional you are as well. So I wish you the very best. I'm gonna come visit you in Colorado. Please do. Uh, Doug? Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, there's multiple levels to Janine, as we know, for all of us. Uh, the work certainly acknowledged within the affordable housing area and, and the opportunity that it enabled us. Without Janine, I don't think we could have done this. With Janine, we didn't just do it. Uh, we did it really well. We did it very thoughtfully. We did it with the nonprofits. And, and what a difference, because there's a lot of policy de developed across our United States. Some of them actually get implemented. The reality is, if you don't do it with the very groups who are trying to make a difference, you're going to miss the target. And so she was she was just excellent at, at developing those relationships and ensuring that whatever policy we were going to put in front of the board, would actually work. And, and now she has this opportunity uh, to carry it, uh, you know, a little further east, mostly south at this point. However, I don't think it's going to stop there. I think there will be a day we see Janine's influence, and it may actually be her, all the way to the east coast again, uh, since that was her start. Uh, the other thing I really want to call out is her, her equity journey um, was part of the park district's equity journey. She she lived it. She breathed it. She talked about it. She was the most common presenter we had at our monthly staff meetings, uh, leadership meetings. In, and we had an ex equity agenda item we intentionally put on the agenda all the time. And it was various staff members, but it was mostly Janine who spoke into these, just bringing a variety of different impacts that, uh, and you could tell all the time it, it was genuine. It was intentional. And it, you know, we all grew from that, Janine. Yeah, Thank you. Oh, I'm going to say one last thing before we give you some time, Janine. But I just, I wanted to echo everything that Doug said, and especially um, his word. His words are perfect for genuineness and intentionalist. That just is you to a T. And I just want to thank you so much for your dedication to our park districts um, and your just willingness to learn and your skill to learn. And not even that, but to even learn it and then digest it and then put it to the board in layman terms so that we can understand it very quickly is just an amazing skill and we so appreciate it and you're just going to be so missed and I always talk about how THPRD the the strongest point that we have is our staff and how wonderful um, and knowledgeable and great experiences and execution and you are just the epitome of that so thank you so much and um, you will just be sorely, sorely missed. We're so sad to see that email that <laughs> came through. So thank you. Thank you all. And I promised myself I'm, I'm not gonna cry. So I'm just gonna take a deep breath um, because this is emotional. Um, the work that we did, and it was a team, it wasn't just me, was because of you. Um, the board empowered, the management team empowered the staff. And really me looking is it, it reignited a fire in me. Um, what you may not know about me, when I practiced law, I did a lot of pro bono work. And boy, if I knew then what I know now, what I could have done, I'd probably still be a lawyer. But I really want to dedicate my life more into this equity realm. And when I looked at what my options and opportunities were, 
this just is a fit with a growing city that is so diverse. Um, I think it's the most diverse city in Colorado, rivals Beaverton, if maybe not even more diverse. So it's just really exciting. I'm going to take the lessons I've learned from you all with me. Um, and you're left in good hands. The planning staff is amazing. Peter was a lot of that technical, the urban planner, Peter Swinton, the technical work that went into the SDC methodology, which by the way, when I started at the district, I said, oh, thank goodness I don't have to work on that because it was up being updated at that time. Um, and then I had that fast learning. Um, our land acquisition specialist, Melanie Moon, is also someone with so much compassion that she brings to her work. And of course, Cindy Dower, um, she's just been phenomenal as well. And my dogs are knocking at the door. But thank you for every opportunity I've had here. And please come visit me in Colorado. Perfect. Okay, well, one last thing. Right, Doug? You bet. You bet. We've got uh, Gary and Tim are going to present uh, on the South Cooper Mountain Project. Yeah, good evening. That, that's a tough one to follow. We're all going to miss Janine <laughs> on staff level, too. We've been saying our goodbyes to her all week and trying to grab as much information out of her, out of her as we can before she goes, too. So, um, and she she did give us all her personal cell phone number in case we need to call her too so that was really nice <laughs> but um good evening and um, thanks for having us i'm gary keck i'm the design and development manager and with me tonight is tim bonnen tim's our senior park planner and he's going to help us go through this presentation tonight but what we're doing is we're requesting board of directors approval of the preferred concept plans for the uh, blackbird farms parks a and b this is a SDC project that the district's been coordinating with uh, Wish Camper Development Partners. And with their assistance, we've gone through the public engagement process that's led us to these concept plans that you'll see tonight. And we've we've got some good interest from the public in them, which has been nice. So with that, what I'd like to do is pass it over to Tim. He's done a great job managing this project for us, and he's going to run through the plans. So Tim. All right. Thank you, Gary. Good evening. Good evening, board members. Um, let's go to the next slide and take a look at the location of the site. So parks A and B are located north of Shoals Ferry Road, uh, west of 170th and adjacent to Mountain Side High School. Next slide, please. Both parks uh, outlined in red are categorized in the parks functional plan as pocket parks and are just under a half acre each. Included in this project, would be um, 13 acres of natural area outlined in blue. Next slide, please. These parks would be designed and constructed by Wish Camper Development Partners for system development charges credits. Wish Camper, the Wish Camper project consists of two sub developments, Main Street, a 9.8 acre commercial site and Blackbird Farms, a 32 acre urban neighborhood site. Next slide, please. Some of you may recall that we presented the preferred concept plan for Main Street Park back in December 2020. Next slide. Uh, parks A and B are located in Blackbird Farms. Park B is in the center and Park A is a little bit to the north adjacent to the natural area. Next slide. And here is the 13 acres of natural area and trail network. The trails shown are still conceptual, but we but will create a cohesive link between Lolic Farms to the southwest and the district's future southwest quadrant seven neighborhood park to the northwest. Let's go on to the next slide. This is the preferred concept plan for Park A. You can see in the lower left there's a shelter. Uh, in gray with some picnic tables underneath it and just to the right is the maroon area that's the play area in the center is a, a level open lawn area and then a little bit north of that you can see some of those blue picnic tables which overlook the natural area beyond and let's go to the next slide and we can look at the perspectives so in the perspectives in the upper left 
you see a view from the natural area or wetland. So you can see the community trail goes up a ramp into a switch back to get you up to the terraced park above. And then to the right is if you're standing in the street at the end of the cul-de-sac, you're looking through the shelter into the park. And of course, book, to bookend this pocket park, there's, there's a multifamily development on each side of it. And then the lower left, it's a great view looking in from the natural area. You can see again, the switch back to get you up to the park, the lawn area, the, the shelter and the play area. And then to the lower right is a view looking down at the play area. Next slide. Um, the preferred concept plan for Part B will be a combination of theme nature play and nature exploration. So think of nature play as traditional play equipment that has a nature theme to it. And then nature exploration is an area where people uh, can use their imaginations. It will be made up of mounds, uh, boulders, logs, even some loose limbs for kids and families to use their imagination to create play in a natural looking environment. Uh, the site will have a looped path that's accessible that will we'll be able to access all these areas that will go through the park along with some um, seating as well. Next slide, please. Uh, throughout the design process, we work with Wish Camper's design consultant to incorporate our vision action plan to create these spaces. Next, please. With SDC developer projects, the developer is responsible for public engagement. And back in 2020, Wish Camper held two virtual meetings to introduce Main Street and Blackbird Farms to the community. We took engagement, though, a little bit further by asking the public what they wanted as a design theme for Park B, and then the types of play equipment they wanted for both Parks A and B. So in August on our website, um, we put these three concept plans uh, on it for, for patrons to vote on. We had a concept A was a fitness park, concept B was a dog run park, and concept C was a nature play park. We had 102 people respond, and overall they favored the Nature Play Park. And then once that park was developed, we put out another, or the concept plan was developed. We went back out in December and held another. And in that survey, again, we had, uh, we put out Park A with two types of play equipment. So Park A had individual pieces of play equipment as one option and the other option was the one that you see here which was a small structure with little shade canopies on top um, a, a web climber and also there's a seesaw in the back that's i know it's a little bit hard to see and also those colorful buttons for kids to climb on and again because this is a pocket park um, we, we want to be able to have a little bit of play for all abilities and all age levels. So again, with the with the buttons down below for smaller kids to kind of crawl over and crawl along the panels uh, on the structure itself. And again, the web climber is something a little bit more challenging for other kids. So that's the one that again that um, patrons chose. And then in the and in the bottom below it um, for the nature play park, um, we had two concepts one was a, a boulder course and the other one was this tree play structure inspired um ropes course um so it's i think it's going to be you know a, an exciting piece of equipment where that will really challenge kids you know the strengths and abilities and balance um, to crawl in and through it so again there's two pieces to it on one end it's the five to twelve year olds which is the larger image and then we do um, have one area for smaller kids, which is the two to five year olds, but that colorful caterpillar down on grade, what's called the Charlotte's web. There's a little table in the back of the web that you can climb up and over and onto, and then a small slide there as well. And then we had um, 62 um, people participate in selecting the play equipment for both parks. Next slide, please. Uh, these parks will be built by Wish Camper Development uh, in exchange for SEC credits. Um, site development is expected to start in spring with the parks completed sometime in 2023. As mentioned earlier, staff are requesting board approval for the preferred concepts concept plans for Park A and B located in South Cooper Mountain. Uh, with that, we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. 
Does anyone have any questions? A, the December survey, so the selection of, of the A or the B, um, how how were community members notified of that? Was that through Wish Camper or through us? That was that was through us. So we put that on our own website. We okay. created um, a web page for South Cooper Mountain because we will be having again. We will be having projects in South Cooper Mountain that are developer led projects. Um, so we have created one web page that will be able to put other. Uh, projects that come along in South Cooper Mountain on. So we have some future parks. There's one in the Heights coming up. There's one in Shoals Heights coming up. And we think this is going to be a great spot for us to locate all those parks in for people to go to and take a look at. And is that information then from our website, is that disseminated through local neighborhood associations or just uh, yeah. how, how are they hearing about it? Yes, I think I put it in the memo and I can't quite remember. <laughs> But I believe this was also sent to the um, to the NAC in that area as okay. well. OK, great. That's great. I appreciate the the community involvement and hoping that over time, I mean, you know, 100 respondents, 62 respondents, that's all great. You know, it'd be great for us to continue with that so that we can um, certainly continue with their input. Thanks for your work. Yeah, Heidi, one thing to remember, too, is there's no homes out there really either. So we're getting that much. And I, and I realize parts. that living not so far from there, but, yeah. you know, just how how that how we get that information out, um, even to folks who sort of frequent that area um, is important. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a great response that we have considering people aren't living there right now necessarily. So thank you. Lisa. Uh, thanks. This is great. I'm so exciting. I just wanted to ask about the ramp um, in in I'm messing up AMP. But I and I I have no doubt that you are asking these questions. I'm just going to also ask around like I'm just wondering about like the the incline percentage, right? And like considering the this is not my expertise, I'm trying. <laughs> but I'm just curious the um how accessible that is for individuals with uh, mobility devices, things like that. Yes, both both these playgrounds are especially the play equipment are designed around accessibility for those. So we did work with a playground manufacturer. Um, for, for both of these, and both of these sites will have the wood chips, those engineered wood fibers, which are accessible. They also have ramps to get people from the walkways into the play area and then onto those ramps as well. So it, it is a, a considered an accessible play structure. And, and as you mentioned, we also want to have things down below too, like the, the buttons that are down on the ground or the little logs and things. So people who maybe have a limited movement can have things more sort of at a at a chair level as opposed to have to get up and into things. Thank you. And I, I think I'm that's very helpful and yay, just again living our values. We keep seeing this this at board meetings, which is so wonderful. Um, but I guess my question is specifically about the ramp and you can send an mm -hmm. email or something. I guess I'm wondering like because you're in we're in a confined space, right? That like we can't go beyond that. And I'm just, you know, I remember with like bridges, we've talked about like ramp inclines. Um mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you have to be mindful of the incline. Again, I, I'm not great with the words here <laughs> because I Lisa, are you talking about the ramp in park A or are you talking playground ramps? Or are you talking about the one that goes back and forth? Yeah, with the switchback, sorry. Yeah, that's what oh, she's talking about. Sure. Sorry, yes. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> oh, with that, yes. I'm sorry. That, yeah, but with the switch black switch back ramp, yes. We've already reviewed those plans as well, and so there's a certain percentage you have to be under uh, eight percent. So I think that might even be down to closer to five percent. So we work with the with the uh, developer as well to keep that down to the minimal. Thank you for your patience at eight thirty at night. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Alfredo. Uh, thank you, Felicita, for the for the question, and uh, uh, that was also on on my mind. So thank you for actually articulating that eventually. So, um, and I just want to say um, thank you all for the creativity that that goes into these. 
Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, speak on behalf of a certain seven-year-old asleep in the house behind me uh, that, you know, those things matter. Um, kids notice these things. Parents notice these things. Families notice these things, um, that these parks are interesting and different and having the nature play adds a different, you know, mental dynamic to it. And um, I, I just appreciate the district for continuing to be creative and be give kids different opportunities to express themselves and explore their world. And, and so thank you. Uh, Heidi, did you have another question? Yeah, I do have one. It's more of a comment than a question. Um, knowing the history of that land and that space, I hope that when when that development really opens up and those pocket parks open up, that we have a, a some type of communication plan or opportunity to you know, let folks know about that. So, and I'm just thinking about families in this area who used to go to the pumpkin patch there mm -hmm. at Blackbird Farm. Mm -hmm. And then when it was gone, we're like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> and so just the opportunity to celebrate this new awesome community and these parks and the trails that'll be along there, you know, I think there's an opportunity for us here to make it a really great and special thing because a lot of folks have lived in this community for a long time and they knew that farm and that space um as their pumpkin pumpkin patch or their you know apple orchard or whatever um so just i, I want to put that out there for us to think about as we do openings and um you know move forward with the, with the future really excited about it it's exciting to see the plan seeing how it's evolved but i also just think about the history of that space too to families in this area great um i did have a couple of questions um i guess we'll kind of go back for concept b or for park b that you guys mentioned that there was like a park for five to twelve and then a park for the littler kids are those based on that is it on opposite sides with the nature place yes yes Split so i did uh, ne neglected to point that out yeah so on each end so okay. we have uh, on the on the west end being the two to five year olds and then a nature play in the middle yep yeah the nature exploration in the middle and then that larger structure will be to the east to the right um and then is there sitting there's no sitting areas i guess m my concern is like if you have like a two-year-old and also a seven-year-old mm -hmm. that's like they can't both play at this, you know, if we are not intermixing and being kind of not multi general, but multi age range, um, mm -hmm. right? You'd have to. Is there can is there a place where you can like put the two year old in that little nature play and still keep eyes on during the nature exploration play, or is there something in the big kid nature play area that has some stuff for also little kids because? A parent usually it's one parent who's taking all their kids right yes yeah, so we yes yeah, so those will be two separate areas that what's not shown in this plan though there, there will be more seating um around this this is the initial design so there'll be some seating actually where that green what is looks like a lawn area there'll be some seating in there so a parent could sit in the middle for that large play and nature exploration so maybe you have one kid in nature exploration and one in the larger play equipment or there'll be some seating down toward the smaller um, smaller play structure that maybe there's some play happening in between there. And again, with the nature exploration, hopefully that'll be an area for both kids to play okay. in. Yeah. Uh, for that imagination, some boulders and things at different heights and some logs, sticks and things to build with. I don't know if you've designed that nature, but I'm wondering if, if you've already designed or if you haven't, if in that nature exploration that you kind of detailed it opposite as far as um, uh, acuity level. So like for the nature play, for the nature play for the older kids, if it's going to be on the right, then the, the right part of the nature play exploration should be kind of towards little kids so that parents can does that make sense? So it intermixes mm -hmm. them um, and then for vice versa for the little kids side, then then you have a higher acuity on the left side of the nature exploration, just so that we're we're not creating separate places for little kids versus big kids, if that makes sense for 
a mom who's watching or a dad who's watching or a grandparent who can't move that much and watching okay. all these kids run around. Um, so that would just be my tidbit for that one. Um, and then for concept A, or park A, sorry, are, is the picnic tables going to be, or do we know what or how big that covered area is? And are the picnic tables going to be movable as we the, all seem to like? Yes, you know, we we did talk of that, about that in the uh, in our internal design team. And with these tables, got to keep in mind, there's a high school next door. And what high school kids do is take picnic tables and drag them out uh, off the trail. So those we think we're going to keep in place okay. for this park. Okay. Because we That's... thought about that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. They, they could end up somewhere else. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Um, my other question is, and that's it's more for a design because um, for those open lawn spaces, do we do we reserve them for like future? Like, are we trying to think of like future field places or anything like that? Like, is there a reason we can't fill them with trees instead of just having an open lawn? Because general, and I'm not, of course, like my experience is not. The same as everyone's but generally when you go to a park like cedar hills or pioneer park where you have that open spaces it's not readily used as much um or like only certain parts are um and so i was wondering if there's if there is a specific reason we always have these big and even if we have big trees or shade like people tend to congregate under those during the summers and stuff and have picnics if there is shaded area versus like if you're at cedar hills at the at the um kids splash pad everyone's under those little trees and no one's actually in the actual field. So I was hoping to see if there's a specific design reason why we do those open lawns or if we plan to have like a movie in the field or something in those places. Well, with, with this though, you have to consider these are pocket parks. They're very, very right. small too. And, and when you look at, you know, the Wish Camper development, we were looking at Park A, uh, Park B, and and the plaza area so we have all right. it's, this is a really cool development you've got three different little pocket parks in one area so that's what i think that's what i like how it worked out with this is with park b this is going to be this sort of forested natural area with lots of trees and very different play right and that's why we actually took that out and put presented that to the communities we're looking for something a different type of play and recreation in that space as opposed to the park a uh, which is nice how we came up with the natural uh, play theme there. So we have that there, and then we have the, the urban space with Main Street, which is going to be right next to the commercial space. So hopefully we'll do some other types of activities there. And this one, I guess we thought because it's so small, it just has a nice open lawn for those types of activities because we even thought for uh, fitness in the park. Okay. If you were to come to this site, this would be the spot. So we do have within the wish camper development we do have that one open lawn area for that type of activity great okay that makes sense um my other question is i don't know i guess it's hard to visualize how big this lawn is but is there not a way and if we could even do like a like a chip trail to like on the on the right side of the lawns because i feel like most people will utilize like the air space closest to the trails but if you had like a chip trail or I'm sure it's more expensive to pour like another trail, but that that roundabout gives gives um, opportunities for parents or somebody to just do laps versus this park doesn't really create a space for walking laps for that area. Um, so I don't know if that's something that can easily be added or accounted for. <laughs> Can I can I throw in here? It looks, I mean, it appears to me, is this like 70 by 70 or 80 by 80 wide? It's a really small, yeah, small okay. space. <laughs> That's why. So I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, I just for scale, I'm thinking it's much smaller than what we may envision of it. And the pocket parks that I know of, um, yeah. I just it's I wanted to add that to it. Ten yeah. tennis court size. <laughs> okay. Of, yeah, we're, this is small as a tennis court. Gotcha. Um, so again, but with that though, um, is you know, the nice thing about this, this is connected to the trail system. And so for exercise, I mean, it's nice. I know you could be in a small space and then kind of walk the, the edges and have the kids in the middle, but there's also going to be this great trail. And this trail, again, will connect down to Lolik 
and it will continue up through up toward uh, the Gorman property and out there, which we didn't show you tonight, but there's actually another little cool area there too for nature exploration, which is gonna be a soft surface trail with some boulders and logs in there too. That is just for part of this open space exploration. It was too much to show in all one slideshow, but there's no little cool piece to it too. So again, this whole development, I, I we're very excited about. It just has a lot of small components, but for that community, they can go and explore in different areas and just have a variety of recreation. I think it's gonna be great. Perfect. Thank you. That's all my questions. Sorry, I have so many. Okay. <laughs> Alicia. As always, President Ping, just really appreciate your insight because I'm not a mom. And so there's things that I don't think about. So thank you. You always, you make me better. I appreciate it very much. Um, I thought I'd make a motion if we're up for that. <laughs> um, let me, oh shoot. Of course I don't have it ready. Just a moment. <laughs> Um, I move that the board of directors approve the preferred concept plans for Park A and Park B located in the South Cooper Mountain. I'm happy to second. Jessica, can you call the roll? Heidi Edwards. Yes. Alfredo Moreno. Yes. Barbie Miner. Yes. Felisa de Monteblanco. Yes. Tia Pink. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for the great presentation. And I think that it right, Doug. Yes, we are there. Great. And so we will adjourn. Thank you everyone for staying late tonight. Have a great evening. Thank you.